One Tree Planted uh, is a global reforestation charity. So we work with businesses, individuals, and in the case of myself and my colleague, Chris, who's a former uh, Major League Baseball player, um, we help uh, our partners uh, meet their sustainability goals through planting trees. Uh, we plant trees in over 50, uh, 50 countries now. <laughs> Welcome to episode 130 of The Route, presented by White Whale Marketing. The Route is a glorified sports business coffee chat that has a new guest every episode as we share their experiences and route in sports. As always, I'm Christopher Nascimento, and let's get started. Before we get into today's guest, just a couple things to cover as per usual. First off, if you're watching us on video, you can see on the top hand uh, corner here of the screen, it says The Route, and then beneath that it says At The Route Sports. That is our handle on all social media. So that's all the traditional ones that most people are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok now, so on and so forth. But the key one here is LinkedIn. So a lot of people listening to this podcast are working in sports business. They're maybe trying to get into sports business. And a lot of you are engaging there. So it's a great place to maybe connect with others, um, potentially grow your network, start your network, et cetera. Check us out at the route sports. We release every episode there as well. So check us out at The Route Sports. Then in regards to the podcast, if you have a moment here, just take the time to subscribe, follow, like, share, et cetera. All that good stuff just allows the podcast to grow that much easier. Um, we're on all the major audio platforms. I believe we're at 10 at the moment. So that's Apple, Google, Spotify, all those key big ones. And YouTube, as I mentioned via video. And for YouTube, we're underneath the White Whale Marketing YouTube channel. So that's White Whale MKTG. Then we have the route playlist there where you can see clips and, and all that good stuff. So check us out um, on those platforms. And I think that should be about it before we get into today's guest. But before we do so, just a quick message from our friends at BetStamp. Damn it, I lost another bet. I always do this. Why can't I win at least one? You need edge in sports betting. BetStamp allows you to compare the best available odds among sports books. To get an edge in sports betting, download the BetStamp app and use the code WHALE to get access to all the affiliates and pricing. The only way to get an edge in online sports betting is by having accounts with multiple sports books. Yes. BetStamp. Now, with that said, uh, I'd like to welcome someone who has worked with the Montreal Alouettes, Canadian Olympic Committee. Montreal Canadiens, and now one tree planted as their senior sports sustainability manager. Dave McGinnis, welcome to the route. How's it going? I'm great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you know, we, we spoke prior to, to, to recording. I'm very excited to hear about your, your route. So maybe let's just start there. Where did it start and how did we get to the position we're in today? Um, I'd say my the route for me really started when I was in university. I went to Queen's University in Kingston. Um, after originally in first year starting in economics, I was able to transfer into their commerce program. And probably around third year, I realized that uh, the typical uh, streams um, in the business world, the, the finances, the the accounting, uh, consulting really didn't speak to me. And I, I don't think I would have been very good at them, to be honest, if that if that was the career path that I chose. And so I wanted to to work uh, in an industry that I was passionate about. And um, I, I realized that sports could be a possibility. There's more and more coverage of, of jobs in, in sports that I became aware of. And so I really began to look into it then. Um, I was able to get uh, an internship with the Kingston Frontenacs of the OHL during my fourth year. So that was my first exposure to working in sports. I, I, I liked it. I realized there was so much more for me to learn. Um, but after I graduated, I, I moved to Montreal to do a graduate program at uh, the John Molson School of Business at Concordia University. Um, those were night classes when I was there. And so um, I was able to use the, the internship experience that I had with the Frontenacs to get another internship with the Montreal Alouettes. And that's something that 
um, I think I did for about uh, a year or so. And so that was incredible exposure um, to, to the world of sports, a great test for me to see if it really was something that I liked. Unfortunately, it was. Um, and I, I continued to do that as I, I fulfilled the requirements of that graduate program, which was in sports administration. That, ha that was in uh, 2000, um, it was the year that, um, I think that was 2004. So the year that 2004, 2005, the year that uh, an entire NHL season was, um, was wiped out essentially through a work stoppage, which in, from my <laughs> selfish perspective, that was very um, beneficial because it enabled me to um, get a more uh, real life experience, having some academic um, uh, background on my CV as well. And so near the end of that year, I started to, uh, as I say, um, professionally uh, harass the Montreal Canadiens. I sent out CVs to, I think, three different departments and just started following up relentlessly, trying to be brought in for an interview. And months went by, and as, as it looked like the it looked like the uh, work stoppage would be coming to an end. I, I really, um, I guess, heightened those, uh, those, those efforts. And eventually I was brought in for an interview and I'd been taking French classes to improve my French because I knew it, it was essential to work in a Montreal market. Um, and, and thankfully I, I was able to leverage those past experiences. Um, the coaching I received essentially for, for interviewing well in French, I was able to translate all that into, uh, an entry level full time position uh, as part of the Canadians marketing department. I was an event coordinator as part of the fan development team. And over the course of the next 14 and a half years, I worked um, uh, in the marketing department mainly as an event manager, project manager, and was asked to do all sorts of incredible things. Um, it was an incredible experience. Very, very thankful to have been given that opportunity. There's so many people to thank along that journey. Um, but that came to an end in, in January 2020, and I transitioned over to my current role, which is, um, as, as you mentioned, Chris, the Senior Sports Sustainability Manager at One Tree Planted, where I manage um, the charity's relationships with uh, professional leagues, teams, and athletes, uh, some university athletic departments as well. Um, so they work with us to, uh, to plant trees to help uh, meet some of their sustainability goals. So. That's a pretty quick snapshot of how I got from, from, from Queens to, to one tree planted. Yeah, no, I think that that's kind of a great um, synopsis of your route so far. And I'd love to kind of get into that further. Um, and if you don't mind, maybe we'll just go back to the beginning then we'll work our way through it. Yeah. Um, and one of the things we kind of chatted about prior to recording is just in regards to hitting almost, let's say that wall in university and realizing, Hey, I can't do the typical business job. Let's yeah. say I need to do something more passionate. And, and you mentioned that uh, at the beginning of your route as well. Was there something maybe more specific that just light bulb moment? I know I was talking with you about maybe it's second, third year when the courses get a little more concentrated. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment in time that kind of just kind of um, sparked you? I suppose there are a number of things as um, just some of my classmates, some of them had a grit, had a very clear idea of what they wanted to do probably from from first year and certainly by the time third year came around a lot of them were very very serious especially in some of the more um i guess technical uh fields like the the accounting and the finances uh, i have a three-year-old three-year um a brother who's three years older than, than me and he went the the chartered uh accountant route and then into a cfa and so i had exposure to what that world was like and i and i knew it wasn't for me and I was reminded at times I had uh, one of one of my housemates who who went the investment banking route. Uh, I remember one Friday uh, afternoon after classes were done, he came home with a a massive smile on his face because he was so excited about how um, the lending rate had been had been lowered or something like that. And I remember thinking, who is this person? Like, <laughs> I need to find the industry that makes me smile the way that finance makes this guy smile and I need to devote my time and energy to a career in, in that industry. And um, not too long after that, um, I, I think I started to put all my eggs in one basket and that being the basket of, of, of the sports industry. And so it was made very clear that I needed to be somewhere <laughs> that I had um, where, I, where I had that passion and I, I knew I'd be able to devote 
um, you know, decades of, of my life in, in a professional context uh, to pursuing something that, that I cared about and made me feel good. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And to be honest, you just saying that about your housemate kind of just reminds me of, you know, my, my dad went to the accounting route. He was a CPA and I thought that's what I was going to do as well. And I remember he really, he was always saying how much he enjoyed, you know, accounting and I'd see him on an Excel and doing all this stuff. And when I, it was time for me to do it, I was like, oh, I hate this. Like, I, I can't do this. So kind of the same thing where I didn't understand how he could enjoy it. Um, and I guess when, when you had that experience with, with your housemate, that was when you realized, right? And was there something specifically too? Was it just, hey, you've always been a sports fan and that's why you wanted to go work in the field of sports? Or was it something where it kind of happened organically and you're like, hey, that's what I should be doing with the rest of my life? Um, I'd say probably one of the things that... Um, clued me into the fact that it could be possible. Um, my, my mom uh, was a graduate of, uh, of Concordia University, and I, I remember being home from Kingston one Christmas or over a holiday break at some point uh, and reading their alumni magazine, uh, in particular about their, their graduate program in sports administration and what some of their graduates went on to do. And I thought, huh, maybe that, that that is a route that that is is realistic and um, that I could pursue. And so I thought more about it. And I think later that year, when I was at the phys ed center, just after a workout, I saw a posting up for that uh, Frontenac's internship um, position because they were recruiting already for the following year. And so I ended up um, getting in touch and I had an interview. I think I think the gentleman's names were Jeff and, and Jared. Um, and, and thankfully they, they brought me on board so they could learn the following year. And so I, I'd say it was through that pro process of kind of small building steps, getting more and more informed on, on what, what the work actually is like. There are actually jobs in, in the industry. It's not the easiest industry to break into, but if you're truly passionate and you're willing to put in the time and you have the great worth work ethic and, um, it, it is something that. You, you can pursue and it's not a crazy thought to think that uh, you could be gainfully employed by working yeah. for a sports organization no 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 absolutely and i think kind of almost piggybacking on, on what you're saying there obviously hindsight is 2020 and i think everyone now if they could go back in time they would maybe do that a little differently or, or this or maybe even provide different advice and i, I kind of do that right when i see the different programs now where i know i wanted to work in sports i wish I would have attended the John Molson, you know, sports conference or different yeah. things like that, that I didn't know about in university. So let's say we're speaking where, let's say there's an 18 year old listening, they're starting university, they're very much where they want to work in sports. What types of things would you maybe recommend now that you know that? Obviously you went to the, that graduate program at Concordia. Mm -hmm. How did you, I know you saw, you saw that pamphlet, but how did you decide on that? Cause I know I have a student working with me. They're thinking about getting into a sports program more specifically. What are the types of things you would recommend someone to, to look for if, if they're just starting off now in school? And um, well, I, as I say, I think if it's if it's a stream that um, some of your listeners might be interested in pursuing or, or, or working in, ultimately, it'd be good to get some real life practical experience. It could be through volunteering, if that's possible, where, where you live or where you go to school to be exposed to the type of work, um, the types of things that you'd be asked to do, because it'd be great to find out if a hopefully it is a fit and um, you know your passion could translate well into into work um but also if it's not to to learn that and to realize that um before you commit to uh you know a four-year program somewhere um and and for me i guess those slow building blocks that uh that, that i was mentioning uh were very helpful because they did serve as good good tests for me to to, to ask so i could ask myself do I like this? Would I be prepared to put in the time that I probably need to put in to this to get from internship volunteering to full time job where you can, you know, you can live and support yourself. Um, so that that's what I would say. I, I, in my experience, I know, say that that internship that I got with the Alouettes was very helpful having the Frontenac experience on my CV because other if I didn't have that, I would have been competing against other candidates who who are university graduates, super passionate about sports, and then it would really come down to who who could sell it better in, in the interview. Yeah. And chances are if you're truly passionate, you'd almost be on equal footing with all the other candidates. But I happen to have something to speak to um mm -hmm. while 
I cared enough about working in this industry that I was willing to work for free for a whole school year. I mean, it was it was Friday night games uh, in yeah. Kingston, but still, it was something that I had that the other candidates didn't have. And I think using that um, type of thinking going forward in your career, it could be very helpful for you. Um, so th those are just some some ba basic ideas, but it would also sh show the recruiters how serious you are. Um, and it's not just, oh, a flash in the pan idea. Oh, I think I, I wanna work in sports and then, but if you're truly passionate about it and you can kind of demonstrate you, you've been on that path and that way of thinking where your interests lie, I, I think it's, it's uh, it makes a more convincing argument when you're sitting down across from somebody uh, in an interview to explain why you're there and why you care about working in sports. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a ton of sense. And I kind of did something similar where for Atletico, my first, let's say, team job in sports, it was yeah. COVID. I know budgets were frozen. So I was like, hey, I obviously was a little ignorant at the time where I thought COVID was going to last two weeks. And I was yeah. like, hey, like, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out until your budget returns. And I ended up working with them for the full season, doing like a full marketing manager communications role for free, right, for their inaugural season. And obviously I learned a ton, got offered the, the position once the season ended full time, but I decided to go to go my own way. But if I never did that, obviously they wouldn't have brought me on because they didn't have the money. And mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of, let's say it's junior hockey teams in Canada, maybe athletic programs and universities as well don't have the budget for full time. But if you're a student, you're able to maybe say, hey, like I can give a Friday night like you're mentioning or something else. That could be a great foot in the door. Um, and I guess building on that as well, do you mind maybe sharing your experiences um, at your internship positions, right? I know you mentioned the Frontenacs and also the yeah. Alouettes. Maybe how did it impact you and how did it maybe launch you to, to your future roles as well? Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, I guess I talked a bit about the Frontenacs and how that enabled me to, uh, to land the internship with the Alouettes. And the Alouettes experience was incredible. Um, you know, I'd have to thank uh, Mark Waitman, who was the VP of events and operations at the time, who ultimately hired me. And I was working uh, day to day with with uh, Savas Pilarinos and Jamie Segain, who are awesome. Uh, you know, they, they, they turned into friends, still friends to this day, but they're great people to, to learn from and uh, really ha got great exposure to to, to professional sports. Um, the way that different uh, departments within a team communicate, how how work is done, how because there's translating what you learn uh, in university, say through a typical business school, which I did at at Queens, and then even taking the the theoretical uh, lessons that you learn, uh, like in the graduate uh, program I did in sports administration at JMSB, but then learning what it's actually like in in a professional sports setting for a team, what marketing really is all about, what ticket sales are really about, what sponsorship is really all about, what some of the challenges uh, are, um, access to players, et cetera, the real life um, lessons that, that could be learned. And again, it was a great test, a great kind of being thrown into the deep end. I think my first, first day that I worked at the Alouettes, it was team photo day. And so we had to go to, um, Olympic Stadium and just arriving there and kind of <laughs> didn't really know what to expect. And all of a sudden the whole team shows up, they're fully dressed in their gear for the team photo and just kind of felt like, okay, this, this, uh, this got serious um, and got real right away, which I was very thankful for because I had been uh, working away at uh, or planning to get to a position such as this for a number of years since third year at Queens. Um, but, but yeah, that experience was was great um, for the first six or seven months. Uh, the only real payment that I received was when I worked uh, game days, uh, which was great. But over time, uh, I think six or seven months in, I have to thank uh, Mark Waitman for going to speak with uh, the president of the team at the time, Larry Smith, and they were able to find budget to uh, to, to help me out um, as, as a student where I didn't have much much time to to be doing anything else between the internship and my school. Um, but they found a, a found money so they get a couple hundred dollars into my pocket uh, each each week to to make life a little bit easier. And so I'd say that experience, uh, again, set the stage to be relevant, uh, I, I think, when it came to trying to get a job, a full time job where there was one available because there wasn't anything at the time at the Alouettes 
that could turn into a full-time position for me. Um, but that experience enabled me to be relevant, I think, for uh, a, a conversation, an interview with, with the Canadians uh, um, in probably three or four months' time after that. And uh, again, I think it gave, came down to, well, you clearly already have a bit, despite being so young, you already have a bit of a path where it demonstrates that you're serious about this. You put in the time and, and you've learned, so you have a little a little bit uh, on your resume versus people fresh out of school who might just be starting. And well, I, I had a little bit to show for myself, which was great when it came to interviewing with, with, with the Habs, when I had actual experience that I could draw upon uh, in my answers to demonstrate that uh, I think I, I belonged in this sort of context because I've done a little bit before. And but again, when it came to that, it was all about demonstrating the hunger and the willingness to learn and be humble and smile and say, yes, happy to do whatever it is that you like and actually mean it when the time came around, yeah. when you were asked, you know, last minute on a Friday afternoon, hey, we need you to work all weekend at this event that just came up and not not stray from what you shared when when you um, when you interviewed uh, for the position originally. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And I guess you're touching on there just a tad about, you know, your time leading into the Montreal Canadiens. But before we do that, um, one of the things you mentioned when you first shared your route was um, <laughs> professionally harassing the Canadians, yeah. right? And I thought that was kind of a funny statement because I'm sure it's true for most people, right? They end up getting into sports where it's almost hard to get in and it's all about who you know at times. Mm -hmm. And then just get, you know, being consistent and putting in that effort. Um, do you mind maybe building on that a bit? What was that like and how did you do it in a professional manner? Well, obviously, I mean, because I think the connotation of harassment is, is, is rightfully entirely negative, but uh, just, yeah. you know, kind of tongue in cheek saying, because um, after I sent out, um, it was uh, a cover letter and a CV to the marketing department, to the VP of the marketing team, who later became my boss many months later, uh, the VP of communications and the VP of operations, because I felt I had something to contribute to all those departments if I was uh, given the chance. Um, but marketing uh, was all, always really the dream to get in there uh, and, and to work as part of a, the marketing team of a professional um, franchise. And certainly was was great the fact that the Habs were my you know child, childhood team. And so there, it fit in many ways. Um, but in terms of the, I, I suppose being um, relentless in my in my ability to to follow up. Um, so after I sent in those CVs, I, I would call to try and speak to the VPs to to follow up on what I sent to try and schedule an interview to move the process along. So I, I was getting closer to being able to you know get hired. Um, but eventually, uh, I was brought in for an interview with the VP of operations because, as it turned out, he was close friends with uh, my boss at the time at the Alouettes, um, Mark Waitman, because they both did similar type roles for their respective organizations. And, and thankfully, Mark, you know, was was fully aware and fully endorsed and helped me uh, to make that connection and and to try and fulfill that dream and, and make it possible to work for the Habs. And ultimately it didn't work out with the operations team. Uh, communications didn't really get a follow up there on the marketing team. Cause as I said, that was really the goal to try and get in with them. Um, they stopped answering my calls uh, eventually cause I, I guess there weren't really any updates, but um, over the course of that winter and spring, as it looked like the CBA was going to, um, um, be signed and agreed to and there'd be hockey the following year i really ramped up those efforts because i didn't want to miss out because i knew they're going to be hiring soon mm -hmm. and so i recall um being in a bit of a panic i suppose because i didn't want to miss that window of opportunity so um i knew that there was because they were screening my calls they probably recognized the number um that they kept seeing so one day when i was at the alouettes i think probably at lunchtime when i had some some free time, I call, I shut the door to one of the small conference rooms and I called from there. Uh, and so clearly Alouette de, de, de Montréal probably showed up. And so um, the right hand of the VP of marketing answered and I was able to get him on the phone and that re restarted the conversation to the point where I think within a couple 
within a couple of weeks, I was actually brought in for an interview with with someone uh, I think who ultimately became the yeah became director of marketing right around the time uh, that I started for the team. And so I'd say yeah, being being relentless in a polite, friendly, professional way, but it's still your dream you're chasing, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't you can't lose sight of that. And if you forget about it so quickly and ah, uh, they didn't answer, they didn't answer, I guess this isn't for me. Well, I put all my eggs into that one basket. I wasn't pursuing anything else. And so I had to, I had to make something work. There was no guarantees it was going to work, but until they told me stop calling, you're never going to be hired here. I was going to do everything I absolutely could just to get into the bell center for an interview and let the cards fall where they may. Um, but I was going to do everything I could to, to get there. And, and thankfully that persistence paid off. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's an unreal story for you. And just you saying how you probably almost even got familiar with your number. And then, you know, once you finally use the Alouette's number, that's probably what yeah. broke you through. That's, that's kind of funny just to, to think yeah, about that. It, it makes a ton of sense. Right. Cause why wouldn't they pick up from the Alouette's right? Cause maybe there's yeah, something that they want to buy tickets or there's, yeah. yeah, there's, there's something in particular that they need to discuss at a professional level. And, um yeah my, it it worked out it worked out for sure no, no harm no foul in that stand exactly for sure. exactly um and i guess then once you finally got the, the position with the habs how did that work out obviously i think you mentioned you were there for about 14 years or so yeah how were you able to, to kind of climb the ladder and what was it like working for you know an organization like that and you know especially in canada being such a you know a historic one as well yeah it's uh it, like i said it really was a dream come true um nothing but positive memories of, of working there and working with incredible staff. Um, you know, I have to thank Ray Lalonde, um, who, who gave me my f first real, real chance, um, uh, with the Canadians by, 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 by hiring me, but learned a lot from him, an incredible amount from him. Uh, John Trzinski, Pat Boivin was my first, um, direct, uh, direct supervisor. Paul Galan in the game presentation department learned a lot from him, called games uh, with him for for four seasons at one point. But yeah, it, it really was a dream come true. Um, kind of felt a little bit like a fish out of water at, at first. Uh, my French was quite good, but it, it would get better um, as the years went on, just being surrounded by uh, incredibly well-educated uh, Francophones who speak a very high caliber of French and reading it every day, speaking it every day and doing the best that I could. So it was wonderful on that level. And I guess on a, in a very basic way, I just tried to, you know, be a, be a positive presence, uh, work hard, uh, do my very best to be good at what I was asked to deliver, um, exceed expectations and uh, just try to make a good impression. And uh, I, I don't think there's anything magical about that it's it's just being consistent working hard and probably the same sort of advice that most of your other guests would share but um if you're the sort of person that people enjoy being around that you're dependable you know you know dave is going to deliver good work then I, I think you're you're controlling everything that you can and uh, fortunately that that helped me and slowly over the years i was asked to assume more more responsibility which uh which was great obviously and over my time with the Canadians, it, it coincided with uh, the beginning of the centennial celebrations, which featured, um, I think it was probably eight or nine different Jersey retirements. So I worked very closely on those. I was very thankful to be given that opportunity. Um, this, there were uh, tribute nights called the, orig the original six salute, which uh, former uh, opponents from the the other original six clubs were were invited to to be recognized before a game. So I worked closely on those. Um, we also had the NHL All Star Game, the NHL Draft. So I got to work closely on those as well. And in addition to my regular work uh, as an event manager, um, tied to uh, the pregame or preseason events such as. For a while, we had an event called the Jamboree, which kind of a, a massive street party around uh, the Bell Center. The players were in attendance, ball hockey, all sorts of activities for fans. Um, that ultimately turned into an inter-squad scrimmage during the preseason. So I got to work on those and then uh, an open practice in, in the winter. And then the years that the Habs made the playoffs, got to work on 
uh, tailgate party, uh, street party, and, and for a number of years, like offsite parties for fans um, leading up to, to, to Habs games. So, yeah, like I said, it was a it was a dream come true in many ways. It's 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 not it's not easy work, nor should it be easy. Um, the hours can be long, but I was exactly where uh, I felt I, I should be. Like I said, the passion um, was there. There was nothing that needed to be faked or anything like that. I'm yeah. happy um, to, to, to work for the team for all those years. So like I said, just nothing but a feeling of gratitude and, and, and thankfulness for, for, for the Canadians for giving me that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it must be quite the experience having you know your, your dreams realized and even just working for, let's say, your childhood club as well. So yeah. that's, you're very, very unique. Um, and I guess before we kind of move on, not to get too deep into to your time there, but I know you mentioned the centennial anniversary of the Canadians, the draft, um, even the All-Star game. Is there maybe a moment in time and on one of those projects that stands out that was like, oh, wow, that was kind of a unique experience or something that, you know, is kind of incredible to look back at? Um, th there, there, are, there are so many. Um, the fact that I got to be the project manager for... I mean, certainly with the support and working with the rest of the marketing team and the whole organization, because these massive events, uh, they really take an entire organization and certainly can't can't be claiming to, to, to have been the one to deliver them uh, single handedly. But have you been asked to play a role in 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 the organizations of those events like the, the Jersey retirements, uh, getting to work directly with uh, Dickie Moore, Yvonne Cournoyer, um, Boom Boom Jeffrey on before he passed away. Um, Larry, Larry Robinson, Sarah Savard, Ken Dryden, uh, Patrick Waugh. Um, just just incredible moments of being able to to interact and um, have a professional role to play with with those uh, incredible men who who I've known about uh, for all my life for as long as I've been a hockey fan. So to be able to be uh, in, in involved in any capacity was was really uh, a dream and something I never could have uh, never could have expected or asked for. But somehow the way things worked out, I was act, I was asked to play a role in all all of those. And another thing that stands out just 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 the way that it worked out the night of it was a very emotional evening um, uh, when uh, Boom Boom Jeffrey on's jersey retired I was retired because um, he had just passed away um the way it worked out will ferrell was, was at that game and because um the director of marketing and and myself had been uh you know working so hard and hand in hand uh uh related to that ceremony um our vp marketing at, had um, arranged for us to escort will from his seats down to the private parking garage and so got to spend maybe about four or five minutes with uh with the legend himself and so um I mean, I'll never forget that. I mean, he's even funnier in person without even trying. Um, so those are just two two memories that that stand out, but uh, they're pretty powerful. Yeah, no, I, I, that makes a ton of sense where, you know, I think some of those names that you were just saying, my dad, when I was a kid playing hockey, I wore number 10. So he was calling me, you know, the you know, Cornwall. Oh, yeah. yeah, just kind of saying all the different names. I'm very much familiar with those. So I can only imagine what it was like for you to experience if you watch when you're when you're younger. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess then just moving on for, from the Canadians, you were then talking about how you went on to One Tree Planted, where, where you are now. How did that transpire? And uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about your, your role there now. Yeah, well, it was one of those decisions that was kind of made for me um, in January uh, 2020, I guess it was, just a little bit before COVID. Um, there was a restructuring at the team and, uh, unfortunately my role got caught up in that and was ultimately cut. And so, um, the page was turned, um, you know, all, all good things uh, come to an end at some point. Um, so that transition, uh, from the time I left the team to starting at One Tree Planted was actually fairly short. I think from the time that I left the Habs to my first day at One Tree Planted was probably only about three weeks or so. Um, cause I've been friends with and, and known the, the founder and president of, of One Tree Planted, Matt Hill for, for many years. Um, uh, we're both amateur rugby players here, uh, um, in, in, in Montreal played club rugby. And, um, so we knew each other, um, quite well. He knew my background and when 
you heard that, um, yeah, I was going through this uh, uh, transition professionally. He um, he shared, I think I think we should chat because I think I think there might be a role here at One Tree Planted for you with your background and the vision that he had for for sports. Because um, I think all the conversations that he was having with the the business world in general and and how much interest there was in in uh, reforestation and tree planting to help achieve sustainability goals he saw a big opportunity for sports just as a big sports fan himself um and knowing how influential sports and athletes are in, in society that he felt well sports is going to should be getting involved in this and they will be getting involved based on what he's seeing uh, in the general business world and so uh, he asked me to come on board to to help lead that division um, of of One Tree Planted uh, to manage our sports relationships and um, business development to a certain extent to to try and get more leagues, teams, and athletes involved in, in what it is that we do. And um, I think it was just three years um, er earlier this month that that'll be that I'm with the organization. Time flies, I guess. Certainly goes by faster when you go through a pandemic and there's a big chunk yeah. of time that just somehow what happened to those years but uh but yeah it's been three years and uh, loving it yeah no that, that's amazing and i guess um do you mind maybe explaining to those listening what one tree planted is and what, what you're all about so they can maybe learn about it a bit further sure so one tree planted uh is a global reforestation charity so we work with businesses individuals and in the case of myself and my colleague chris who's a former uh major league baseball player um we help uh, our partners uh, meet their sustainability goals through planting trees. Uh, we plant trees in over 50, uh, 50 countries now. Um, and so there's our, our main model is um, a dollar plants a tree in, in our large scale reforestation projects. We do offer um, tree planting event uh, coordination services in addition to uh, urban forestry, which is uh, a growing space and particularly uh impactful for uh for sports teams and athletes so that's that's how we um that's how we work yeah no that, that makes a ton of sense and i guess from that standpoint not not to get too specific into it is it more so just maybe helping them plant trees in a certain area or like their, their local neighborhoods or even just abroad as well like for um, it, it, it would be both i mean the way that we work um uh we we speak with our partners so you know, a league, a team, or, or an athlete in particular, to find out what it is that they're looking to accomplish. Some um, might be more interested, say, in large-scale reforestation at a dollar per tree in, in one of the great projects that we have worldwide, uh, but also within a particular country that they, they like to, to focus on, uh, very strong in Canada and the U.S. Um, but then there, there are others that some teams, say, might elect for a tree planting event because they'd like their front office to come out and make an impact say during earth month uh in, in april and so we have the ability to coordinate that because we have community partners uh, around the world as well and so uh, we have the ability to organize those and the urban forestry space um as i mentioned that's a growing area for us so those are larger scale opportunities in urban environments so in cities so as, as you're probably aware a lot of a lot of stadiums um typically are located in areas where they, they might be surrounded by a lot of underserved communities where there's not a lot of tree cover or green space in general. And so um, the term being those areas that very often are communities of color. Um, and so in those underserved communities, we try to um, provide options to help leagues, teams, athletes um, address that environmental injustice uh, by, by planting trees in those areas. Yeah, no, that sounds like an amazing initiative. And um, maybe like one of the last things we can kind of dive into before I have these two final questions I'd like to wrap up. I think it's kind of just unique to just see where your career has gone, you know, where you work for different teams. And even now with um, One Tree Planted, where I know when we kind of hopped on the call here, we're just chatting about, you know, initially when you think of working in sports, your mind goes to GM, trainer, uh, what was the other one, agent. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of cool just to see all the different experiences you were able to get yourself and even just what, what you're doing now. Um, 
And then, yeah, I think that, that's been a great job to just kind of share what what's possible within sports. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I like to wrap up every single episode is kind of asking guests two questions at the very end to just put a nice bow on it. So I'm very um, much in the mindset I'm going to live until I'm 103. I've repeated <laughs> it for 130 episodes now. People are probably sick of it. I'm going to be in a rocking chair sitting back and thinking about all the good times that I've done. Yeah. What's maybe one story to date, whether it's at your current role now or maybe something when you're with the front next, you know, or anywhere in between, what's one story that's going to stand out to you that you're always going to remember even at that, that old age? Well, I, I probably all, already shared it. Um, the interaction with, with Will Ferrell, uh, that, that stands out because it was so un unexpected. And uh, the fact that he, he would be in Montreal, he was in Montreal filming uh, the film Blades of Glory, I think it was called. And so mm -hmm. that, yeah, it was so unexpected. And especially back then, I guess, not too far removed from university, being a, a fan of his work, uh, that, that definitely stands out. But I think probably day in, day out in general, just having had the ability to work for, uh, like in the sports specific context, if, if we focus on that, uh, having worked for the Canadians uh, day in, day out, and just, just being around such an incredible organization and um, just the energy and the vibe, the, the buzz of, of, of working for a team like that and, and being asked to, to work on meaningful projects um, featuring alumni, current players at certain times, stuff that gets covered uh, in, in the news on, on a daily basis in, uh, in a hockey mad city like Montreal and a province like Quebec. And so just having been afforded that opportunity, I think that's something I'll, I'll never be able to forget. Yeah, and to be honest, I, I'm in Ottawa. Obviously, I'm a Senators fan, but uh, I, I went to a Montreal Canadiens game when I was in university just to experience it with, with my childhood friend that was living there. Yeah. And it's crazy how different it is, right? I've been to games in Ottawa and in different cities in the States as well, and you're absolutely right. There, even, there's a buzz. Like, it's just different when you enter that yeah. building. It's a unique experience. So I'm sure right. working there could have just been unreal. Mm -hmm. and, and the last question I then have for you, went to the future – now going to the past, talking to a younger, let's say Dave, right? Let's say yeah. you at 18 about to enter into Queens. What's yeah. one piece of advice that you've you know learned since um, attending university that you wish you could share to a younger version of yourself if you go back in time? That's a great question. I wish you had shared that in advance so I could have thought of it. Um, I, I would probably just reinforce the importance of character trying to be a good person be good to all those around you work hard again it's nothing magical but to, to not forget um about those things how important relationships are um connecting well with people those and not just from a selfish perspective but just those are truly meaningful and um be very powerful and, and help you in, in your career and to never to never lose sight of that of, of yeah, just trying to be a good, decent human. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. Sorry for catching you off guard there, but no, I think after doing all these episodes too, I think people think you need something profound, but I think what the theme is with that question is it always ends up being something, you know, basic that people always end up forgetting sometimes where maybe we just, let's say, overthink things in career, life, et cetera, but it's just the basics, right? That, that's always kind of needed to be reminded. So, no, I think this has been perfect. Um, unless you have anything else to share, uh, I think this has been fantastic. No, and thank just, you just thanks again for the opportunity. It's been a blast. Yeah. Well, that's it then for episode 130. And, you know, see everyone uh, again next week. Thank you.